Tom Moran here from Tom's Big Spiders. This is going to be part two of my featured species. Again, with these videos, I'm trying to pick species I have a lot of experience with, maybe raised more than one sling, maybe bred, ones I feel very comfortable giving as much detail as I can about the husbandry. I know with a lot of my videos, I do this during the rehousings, and that can be distracting, although I think it's good to show how they can be rehoused safely. This one is going to focus on just beautiful pictures of the spider and footage of the spiders while I try to give as many details as I can about it. Also, one of the things we're trying to do with these videos or moving ahead is when possible, include footage of them in their natural habitats because I think that's important for us to know where they come from and to get details of what their natural environments look like. And so I have to extend a huge heartfelt thank you to Tarantulopedia for letting me use footage of the Harpactera pulcherpes in this video. He shot some amazing footage. I'm going to include a link to that at the end of this one. And he's nice enough to let me use it so you guys can see what they look like in their natural habitat. So again, thank you so much. I'm going to encourage people to sign up or subscribe, check out some more of his videos because I think we need to support the folks in the hobby that are going out, doing the footwork, and seeing these guys in their natural habitat. This footage is just amazing. So with that said, I'm going to shut up. We're going to get into watching the actual video. When photos of the Harpactera pulcropes first circulated on the forums and message boards in 2012-2013, many keepers couldn't wait to get one of these stunners in their collections. However, even the tiny slings commanded exorbitant prices, with the first round of captive bred slings imported into the U.S. selling for $500 and higher. When I acquired my first two specimens in the summer of 2015, it was the most I had ever paid for tarantulas. Today, many keepers still consider the Harpactra pulcropes a striking gold-bodied and metallic blue leg beauty to be one of the hobby's crown jewels, and this species still pops up on many wish lists. Thankfully, as the species is easily bred, it has become readily available with slings now commanding between $50 and $100 in U.S. currency. As a result, more and more people are starting to find the H. pulcropes in their collections. Harpactra pulcropes are old world tarantulas found around the town of Makanda, previously Grahamstown, on the eastern Cape province of South Africa. This region experiences a temperate climate with relative warm weather all year round with high temps that reach 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 27 Celsius, in the warmest month with lows around 59 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius. In the cooler months, temps rise only to around 68 degrees Fahrenheit, 20 degrees Celsius in the daytime and drop to 42 degrees Fahrenheit, 5.6 degrees Celsius during the chillier evenings. Rainfall ranges from about 3 inches or 75 millimeters in the wettest month to 1 and a third or 33 millimeters in the driest month. As a result, the species care sheets that indicate this tarantula needs to be kept at higher so-called ideal temps should be ignored. Like most baboon species or Theraphosidae from Africa, the H. pulcropes is considered to be fossorial, constructing burrows that allow it to ambush prey while seeking refuge from predators and the elements. In the wild, females have actually been spotted with older slings still congregating around them in their burrows. Like the Monocentropus balfouri, it appears that this baboon mother is quite nurturing to her young, which had led many to speculate on its viability in a communal setup. However, keepers who tried to set the species up communally were reportedly not successful, eventually ending up with one or two very fat spiders. As a result, communal setups should not be attempted. For more amazing footage of a mother with her slings, please check out the video, The Most Beautiful Blue-Legged Tarantula in the Wild with Her Babies, or Pactra Pulcropes by Tarantulopedia. Just click the link at the end of this video for more stunning footage. Behavior-wise, slings start off quite skittish and incredibly fast. This is the only spiderling I've ever had not only escape during a feeding, but end up on my back. Others have also reported that their wee ones are quite the flight risk, so caution is needed during maintenance and rehousings. As a fossorial species, they appreciate some substrate to dig in. Slings that establish dens will be more likely to retreat to their homes when disturbed rather than bolt out of their enclosures. Cocoa fiber, peat, topsoil, or a mixture of any or all of these three make for suitable substrates. Some folks even prefer to add vermiculite or sand to their mixtures. Despite its fluffy consistency when dry, cocoa fiber can still work for burrowing tarantulas. As the spiders dig, they will reinforce the burrow walls with webbing, which keeps the tunnels from collapsing. For tinier slings, a deep dram bottle, 5.5 ounce or 30 milliliter deli cup will work great. Larger, more established slings will do well in a 16 to 32 ounce or 0.47 to 0.94 liter deli cup or something around that size. Feel free to experiment with what works for you, but just be sure to keep the ventilation holes small enough so that they do not permit escape. 
Keepers should note that the Critter Keeper style enclosures, even the extra small sizes, are not suitable for slings, as the ventilation slats pose an escape risk. With my slings, I included a piece of cork bark for a hide, a starter burrow, some sphagnum moss, and a small bottle cap water dish. This is one of the species I've caught drinking from both the water dish and the webbing. To start, I kept the lower levels of substrate moist so that the spider could burrow to find the moisture level it needed. I would re-moisten the dirt when I saw the darker band demarking the damp substrate getting too low. My slings all burrowed while also doing quite a bit of webbing on the surface. I fed my slings one small roach or cricket twice a week, and all three were voracious eaters and excellent hunters. There is no right or wrong feeding schedule, and many keepers feed their spiders weekly or bi-weekly. Find a feeding schedule that works for you. If you can't find prey small enough, slings will scavenge feed off of pre-killed items. Cricket drumsticks, or the severed legs of crickets, or mealworm sections work great in these situations. Mealworms can also be refrigerated, which means you can save extras and always have them on hand. When in pre-molt, expect slings to bury themselves in their burrows by closing up the entrances with webbing and or dirt. This is totally normal pre-molt behavior and your spider's way of putting up the do not disturb sign. When this occurs, keep the water dish filled and be sure that if you add water to the substrate, you don't accidentally flood the spider's den. Refrain from disturbing or digging up the spider if this happens as you run the risk of interrupting a molt and harming your animal. As always, tarantulas do well at room temperature, which for most of us is upper 60s to mid 80 degrees Fahrenheit or around 20 to 29 degrees Celsius. When considering that this species endures temperatures in the 40s in the wild, there should be absolutely no need for supplementary heat. My first two specimens were kept between 68 and 76 degrees during the winter and between 72 and 88 during the summer. I did not notice a large difference in growth rate between these two periods. In these temperatures, this species grows at a medium pace, with mine going from about 3 quarters of an inch to 3 inches, or 1.9 to 6.2 centimeters, in a year's time. Keep in mind that higher temperatures usually lead to faster metabolism, so folks keeping their collections in warmer temps will likely experience faster growth. As juvenile is a relative term when discussing tarantula size, we'll use that term to refer to H. pulchropes that have reached the 1.5 to 2 inch, 3.8 to 5 centimeter mark. It's usually right around this point that this species starts to pick up some of the blue on its legs. There are many suitable enclosures available for juvenile spiders, including small critter keepers and the two quart clear mainstay canisters sold at Walmart. Personally, I find something between two quarts to one gallon, or 1.89 to 3.79 liters, works well as long as it offers some room for several inches of substrate. As always, I include a cork bark hide with a starter burrow and some sphagnum moss and a water dish. Also, be sure that the enclosure is well ventilated. Like slings, juveniles will still burrow if offered the room to do so. Therefore, you want to give them several inches of substrate to create their dens. Although all of mine did quite a bit of burrowing at this size, they also spend a lot of time on the surface webbing and just hanging out. It is a good thing that they are more visible from this point on too, as their juvenile colors are simply stunning. Every so often, I'll moisten down a corner and sprinkle some water on the webbing, although they don't seem to be moisture dependent at this size. Like their younger counterparts, juveniles are fantastic eaters who can take down large mealworms, medium to large crickets, and large red runners with ease. I usually feed mine once a week from this point on. Unlike slings, which will usually retreat to their burrows to feed, large specimens may be quite content to eat right out in the open if left undisturbed. I found the growth rate for H. pulchropes to be in the medium range, with males reaching maturity between 16 months and 2 years time, and females taking about 3-4 to four years to hit breeding size. The H. pulchropes is sexually dimorphic, and the males tend to be much smaller and more leggy than their female counterparts with a duller coloration. This is a medium-sized tarantula species overall, with females reaching a maximum diagonal leg span DLS of about 5 to 5.5 inches, or 12.7 to 14 centimeters max. Males, on the other hand, mature out at a much more thin and gangly 4 inches, or 10 centimeters. As for enclosure sizes, adults will do well in something around 2.5 to 5 gallons or 9.5 to 19 liters or so. Giving them more space definitely won't hurt them, so something around 10 gallons with some decorative foliage and appropriate hide would be fine. Although many older specimens may not burrow as much, be sure to give them several inches of substrate anyway to give them the option. My adult female has been a very prolific webber, covering the majority of her substrate and hide with a thick blanket of white. She is also the most visible baboon species I keep, and can almost always be found right out in the open and outside of her den. Temperament-wise, many consider the H. pulchropes to be one of the calmer and more laid-back species of baboon tarantulas, and I personally recommend them as a great starter old-world species. The three I've kept usually became quite visible once they hit the 2-3 to three inch mark, 
and I've never had any issues with them bolting or throwing up threat postures from that point on. Now, obviously the 4-H pulcropies I've kept don't represent a large enough sample for me to make a definitive statement about the species temperament. Although mine have all been well behaved, that might not be the norm. So I reached out to my subscribers who have kept them before with a poll to hear what they have experienced in terms of temperament with their larger specimens. Needless to say, the results were quite interesting. 37% reported that their juvenile to adult specimens were skittish and or defensive, while an almost equal number, 36%, said that they would describe theirs as laid back and quite visible. 18% chose the middle ground with the shy and visible option. The good news is the majority of folks don't report defensive behavior. However, with 37% of folks reporting they do experience skittishness and defensiveness, it's important to remember that temperament can vary from specimen to specimen, and not all H. pulcropies are relaxed. 9% of those polled chose the other option, leaving comments to explain. For example, Alex from the amazing channel Tarantula Haven states, Mine has been relatively laid back and visible all the time now, but recently it has been very prone to threat postures when I open the enclosure. But I'm pretty sure that it's because she's outgrown her enclosure and doesn't really have anywhere to retreat. Invertivision says, I had four, but now just two. Raised all from slings, and it's a toss-up, really, between skittish defensive and laid back outside. They are almost always outside and only seem to be skittish if in pre-mole. Kelly Ferenz from KF Inverts writes, I've had several adult females and a few hundred slings of H. pulcropies. I've had calm females that would almost never threat posture, and I've had females that are more bitey than OBTs. Mine are usually also visible most of the time. I'd probably go for the first choice, though. Web browser explains, My girl is an absolute sweetie. I don't believe I've handled any of my old worlds except for my H. pulcropies. I don't bother with trying to prod her out as a handleable animal. No, but every rehousing she is just so relaxed as I move her out of her enclosure, I let her have a little walk around on me while I tidy her place up. She's a pretty big girl at this point, and in the past year or so I've noticed her to be more reclusive than in her younger days. Love, love the species for their coloration and that awesome chill personality. So, although your chances of getting a more manageable baboon are quite good with this species, never forget that these fast and potent old worlds can potentially be a handful. Like most of the baboon species, the H. pulcropies don't get as fat in the abdomen as some of my New World terrestrial teas get when they are about to molt. Despite powering down several crickets, their abdomens never seem to get overly plump. Generally, if it stops accepting food and becomes more sedentary and lethargic, assume that it is in pre-molt. The colors of older specimens also become darker and more faded during the pre-molt period, which can be another indicator that a molt is on the horizon. Now, all of the mentions of its laid-back temperament and ease of care likely have some folks asking the question, would this be a good beginner tarantula? Unfortunately, the answer is no. Despite its reputation for being calm, this is still an old-world tarantula species that, if provoked, could administer a nasty bite. Even calmer old-world species are capable of amazing bursts of speed and impressive threat displays, two events that would give the average beginner nightmares. However, for folks who have mastered their basic husbandry and have experience with new world species, the H. pulcropies could make an excellent beginner for those looking to get into old world tarantulas. With its handsome appearance and overall calm demeanor, especially for a baboon species, the Harpactera pulcropies is easily one of my top three favorite tarantula species. For hobbyists looking for a hardy, beautiful, visible tarantula in their collection, you can hardly do better than the golden blue leg baboon. All right, hope you found that informative. Again, thanks so much to Tarantupedia. I keep wanting to throw another syllable in there and I apologize. I, I practiced this word a million times before this video and I still screwed up. So Tarantupedia, please check them out. There's gonna be information at the end of this video for you guys to click on and see the entire video that I pulled these clips from as well as subscribe to them. Again, I think when investigating tarantula husbandry, it's important to kind of take a look at where they come from in the wild. And these folks that are going out there catching this footage is doing the hobby a huge service because we can kind of get real life life photos and footage and video to see exactly where they come from and what the terrain looks like, what their burrows look like, and that is completely invaluable. Also, I want to thank all the people that chimed in on the poll moving ahead for these videos and most of my videos. I'm going to start reaching out. Again, when I do husbandry videos, it's usually not just my information and observations. I do include that, but I've talked to a lot of people about these species and gotten their notes and their feedback, so I try to include that as well. However, I want to hear from you guys. I want to hear what you're seeing and what you're observing, and for this one we got some good information as far as the fact that 
Yes, a lot of them are pretty laid back or shy, but we do have ones that are defensive and people need to be aware of that. So moving ahead, I'm going to do more of that. I tried to include uh, some comments from the comment section of this poll, but unfortunately I couldn't include them all. Originally I had like 15 or 20. It was just taking too long. But moving ahead, no, if you comment, I will be handpicking some of them to put up and display in the video so that people can see what you guys are saying because I think that's very powerful. And again, for these husbandry videos, don't just take my word for it. Feel free to do more research. Read the papers on them. Go to arachnoboards and see what people have been doing. You can trace it all the way back to years before I was keeping. But make sure you go out and do your research. I like to give people a good springboard to start with. I'd like to think that people are starting with my husbandry videos and setting their spiders up using them, are getting off on the right foot, and are going to have healthy spiders. But again, I'm not the be-all, end-all. Go out there, do some research, see what other people are saying. All right, so that should about do it for this one. Again, please check out Tarantupedia if you're not already subscribed. And subscribe, great channel, you won't be disappointed. And I'm going to put the other clip from that video down in here. And then if you saw that, if you like this video enough that you'd like to subscribe, to my channel very much appreciated you can click my little thing up there or check out another one of my videos over in here as always love to get comments please feel free to comment i answer every single one of them and we'll catch you guys next time